Hi, welcome back to Biochemistry Laboratory Techniques. My name is Kevin Tokoff. Make sure to like this video and subscribe to the channel for future videos and notifications. All right, so um, basically what we've been doing in the last few videos is talking about ways to purify proteins. Okay, one of the best ways is um, we can do uh, different types of chromatography and there's other things we can do as well. That's not the point. We do all these purification steps and in theory we should get a pure and pure protein. And there's, there's ways that we have to quantify that, and one of the ways is to construct something called a purification table. And one of the things that we include on a purification table is an enzyme's activity. Okay, now what do you think of if you think of an enzyme activity? If you had no idea what that was, what does that sound like to you? Well, you think of an enzyme's active, that means it's able to catalyze a reaction. You think of what's one way I could think to measure, you know, it catalyzing a reaction. Well, you know, maybe how many reactions it does in a unit of time, right? So let's suppose I have this generic reaction up here. So I have enzyme 1, I just call it E1, and it converts A to Z. Okay, substrate is A, product is Z. And think about how could I measure, you know, how could I measure um, how many reactions it does in a unit of time? Well, if I knew... Um, you know, I mean, let's think about it. Maybe every reaction this does, it produces a Z, right? So maybe it just kind of thinking about this logically, you know, maybe it does, I don't know, 100 molecules of Z in, uh, in 10 seconds, right? 100 molecules of Z in 10 seconds. That seems like measuring an activity, and it turns out that this is actually pretty close to what it is. And you can think 100 molecules per second. Well, can you convert molecules to moles? Yeah, you can. So it turns out that one way you can sort of think about uh, achieving an activity, and we'll show you, I'll show you how to do this, is you can think about it, it's a concentration per unit time. Okay. So what's the change in the concentration of Z as time changes? Okay. And that's sort of one way you can think about an activity. How much, how many Z's does it produce in a given unit of time? Okay, and what we're going to do in this video, this is going to be a very rigorous uh, video. I'm going to show you where the definition of enzyme activity comes from. All right, and to understand this, we need to understand that whenever you're doing this kind of purification, if it's of an enzyme, you have to have two different graphs at least. All right. One of these is called an activity assay. Okay, that's what this is right here. Activity assay. What's an activity assay? It's something. It's, a, it's something where you're um, you're quantifying the activity of an enzyme. When I say an activity, how many reactions does it do per unit time? Okay, that's essentially what it is. Or how much product is it producing per unit time? Kind of the same thing. Now remember, I said per unit time. So your graph should be absorbance versus time. And this is done using a UV vis spectrophotometer. Absorbance per time, right? The other graph, and this is where a lot of the confusion comes from, this one right here, okay, at some point what you may have done is you may have graphed absorbance versus concentration, okay? And this is concentration, say, of Z. And the reason I chose Z is because I chose this reaction as A gets converted to Z. So let's say I'm measuring Z to determine the, help determine the activity. Okay. When you do absorbance versus concentration, remember this is according to Beer's law. This is Beer's law. And I'll just tell you this, one of the very useful, um, useful uh, qu quantities that comes out of this is the extinction coefficient, epsilon. Okay, I want you to file this in your mind that we're going to be using the extinction coefficient. And one thing I like to do um, to help me when I'm, when I'm doing these kind of purification tables is whatever species this is that it's the concentration of, I'll put it as a subscript right here like this. So it's the extinction coefficient of Z. If I was measuring the extinction coefficient, I don't know, of benzoic acid, I might put the extinction coefficient and benzoic acid is given by HBZ. All right, so something like that, and that would tell me this is the extinction coefficient of benzoic acid. All right, so I want to have some way to know what I'm dealing with. 
the main thing that we're initially concerned with is this plot of A versus T, the activity assay. So remember what you basically did, all right? I have it right here. You have some container that has all of your enzyme in it, okay? It's a solution with your enzyme. I don't know how much of this is. It could be something as much as 20 milliliters. It's usually quite a bit. What you're going to do is you're going to take some of this total volume of all of your enzyme in solution, some very small amount, something like this amount, little amount, something in like microliters. You're going to take it and just pipette it into a cuvette. And of course, you are going to dilute it okay, with something else, right? It's going to be diluted probably with buffer or something like that, but also you're going to have the enzymes the substrate in there, of course. And ultimately, um, the volume of the enzyme in the cuvette is going to be quite a bit smaller, a lot smaller than the total volume that you started with. Okay, so maybe out of this, I don't know, maybe this is 20 milliliters. Out of that 20 milliliters, maybe you pipetted into here 0 0.04, let's see, 1, 2, yeah, 0.04 mils, right? So not a lot. You just took a little bit of this in there and put it in the cuvette along with um, a solution of its substrate, maybe some water, whatever. Okay, you put a little bit in there. All right? And I'm calling that volume of enzyme in cuvette. I may abbreviate it as V sub E, but V total is the total of everything um, that you have. All right? So now, what do I want to do? I have this equation here of y equals mx plus b. That's what gets spit out by Excel, but I know that the y-axis is absorbance. I know the x-axis is actually time, so my equation is really a equals mt plus the y-intercept. And my question is, is there anything useful that I can get out of this? And it turns out there is. Okay. What I'm going to do is I'm going to show you how to determine the enzyme's activity, Okay, one form of the activity. So how much absorbance is there per minute? Okay. What I'm going to do to determine this and show you this is I'm actually allowed to take this whole equation and differentiate everything with respect to time. So I'm going to differentiate A with respect to time, I'm going to differentiate MT with respect to time, and the y-intercept with respect to time. So what I get is dA dt is equal to, and this now because this is the, a differential product, I have to apply product rule, so this is m times the um, derivative of time with respect to time. That's just one, right? This quantity, because it's dt over dt, that is one. And then it's time times the derivative of the slope with respect to time, plus the derivative of the y-intercept with respect to time. Notice the slope isn't changing, so that's zero. The y-intercept isn't changing, so that's zero. So ultimately what I have is dA dt is equal to m. Okay? This is going to be very, very important. I want to make sure you understand this. If I take dA dt, the change in absorbance with respect to time, that's just the slope of, the, of this activity assay. Okay? And because absorbance is unitless and time is usually in seconds or minutes, normally you do this in seconds, this slope is going to have units of 1 over seconds or 1 over minutes generally. Okay? These are going to be the units. And you have to pay very close attention to what units they are. If this time on the x-axis is in seconds, then the m is going to be 1 over seconds. If you do it in minutes, it's going to be 1 over minutes. All right? So that's very important. Keep that in mind. dA dt or is the slope of this line. All right? So now, suppose for a plot of A versus C. So now we're dealing in, now we're not dealing with the activity assay. We're dealing with this. Okay? So suppose you generated that experimentally, determined an extinction coefficient. Suppose for a plot of A versus C of the of Z, which is the product of the reaction, product of enzyme one. The regression line is given by y equals mx plus b. Of course, that's what we expect. But remember that for that, y is the absorbance. The slope, if it's following Beer's law, so A versus concentration, remember that the slope is epsilon times the path length. If you need help with Beer's law, go back and review that video. But m is just equal to extinction coefficient times the path length. x is the concentration, and b is just b. It's the y-intercept. Again, what you're allowed to do is that you're allowed to differentiate all this whole equation with respect to time. Okay? There's a reason I'm going to do that. And you'll see. So differentiate A with respect to T, dA dt. This right here, this is actually um, a set of products. So I need to treat all of these kind of the same way. So I'm differentiate with respect to epsilon first. So LC times d epsilon dt. 
Now I'm going to differentiate with respect to L, epsilon C, DL, DT, plus now I'm going to do it with respect to concentration, so epsilon L, D, C, DT, and then I add on the derivative of the y-intercept with respect to time. Now the thing to notice, is epsilon the extinction coefficient changing? No. Does the path length of the cuvette change? No, the cuvette's not changing sizes, so these two terms are zero. Does the y-intercept change? No, it's part of the equation, so that's zero. So the only term that you're left with is this. And since the concentration is changing, this derivative is not zero, so what you're left with is the change in absorbance of Z with respect to time. I'm now indicating this Z here because I do want to indicate it is for this reaction. You're measuring Z because that's your uh, chromophore is equal to the extinction coefficient of Z times the path length times the change in the um, concentration of Z with respect to time. And if you remember something, remember up here I said, I think I said it somewhere, this right here, Z over T was sort of like the activity. I can write that as the derivative of the concentration of Z with respect to time. And that's also the indicator of the activity. I need that quantity, okay? So dA dt is equal to epsilon of Z, L times derivative of concentration with respect to time. All right, that's really important. Now also remember this quantity right here. Get this. This quantity dA dt, remember that that was actually that was just m. That was the slope. So if you remember, come back up here, remember we said that dA dt was just m, the slope, that thing that's in per second or per minute? That's really important. So I'm going to replace dA dt with m, and I still have extinction of coefficient of z times the path length times dC dt. All right? This quantity right here, this is ultimately what I want, so I want to solve for it. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to divide both sides by epsilon z l. All right, that cancels. So what I get is the, the dc dt ultimately for z is equal to m, which is the thing that's in per second or per minute, the activity, divided by the extinction coefficient of z divided by the path length. And then there's one thing I do have to add on to this, and it, it does account for um, generally any um, dilutions that I had ultimately. Okay. So what I did theoretically remember, if you go back up to these test tubes in the cuvette, is I had a total volume of the enzyme that I had purified at that point, maybe that was 20 mils, and then I took from that maybe 0.04 milliliters, right, and I put it in the cuvette, and it was mixed with other solutions, but it was ultimately, you know, it, it was diluted more, okay. So ultimately, um, I need to multiply by a correction factor, and it turns out that in the numerator you have the total volume, in the denominator, you have the volume of the enzyme in the cuvette, that smaller volume. And it turns out this derivative, dc dt, if I can get it in the following units, if I can get it somehow in micromolar per mil per minute, then this is the activity per mil. This is very, very important. This is what you want to get. Okay, if I can somehow get this in this, um, in this form, then I've, gotten, I've, I've achieved the activity of the enzyme, okay? So what I'm gonna do is, um, I'm ultimately going to put the units of all these things up here, I'm gonna put the units, and then I just wanna manipulate it until I get to U per ml, and show you that this stuff right here can be converted into U per ml, which is ultimately micromoles per mil per minute, okay? All right, so how do we do that? Well, let's start with this m in per second. So I'm going to say this is 1 over second, so per second, all right? And then ultimately, what's, what's the volume on the top? Well, what I'm going to do is I'm going to do a little cheat, and I'll, you'll see why I do this in a minute. This volume on the top, and we'll go over this more in another video, I want this volume to be in liters. So whenever we talked about it, you don't really, you don't have liters of your enzyme purified. You have probably mils of it. But I'm just going to convert it to liters, and you'll see why I do that in a little bit. All right, it's a, just kind of a trick to help you. All right, and then I'm going to divide by the extinction coefficient. What are the units of the extinction coefficient? Well, it's just one over molar, right? Because it's inverse molar, and then times one over centimeters, right? Inverse molar, inverse centimeters. I'm also dividing by the path length. That's in units of centimeters, right? And then I'm also going to divide by the um, little volume of the enzyme, but what I'm going to do is I'm going to put that in milliliters. 
Okay, and there is a reason I do that and you will see it now. Because remember, if I'm trying to get U per ml, U per ml is the same as micromole per mil per minute. So I want to manipulate this stuff somehow to get it in these units and then I've gotten the U per ml. All right. So what do I have to do to this? Well, I need it in per minute, right? So this is seconds, so maybe I need to multiply by 60 seconds in a minute. And what you will notice is that the seconds here cancel. Seconds cancel, now I have it per minute, okay? What else can I do? Well, notice one thing. I have this mole, molar right here, capital M. Remember that a molar is equal to a mole per liter? So if I have one over molar, that's liters per mole. Okay, and because a molar is equal to this, then a molar is a mole per liter, all right? So that means that this molar right here cancels with this molar, and I have it in a mole per liter. Okay, that's not that difficult. Also notice centimeters cancels with one over centimeters here, okay? The other thing also that happens now is, remember I said to put this V total in liters? Well, now that I put molar, or one over molar, in liter per mole, this liter cancels with that liter. Okay, and what I would also like to do is convert this one over moles here. I'd like to convert it to millimoles, or excuse me, micromoles, excuse me. So I know that one mole is equal to 10 to the sixth micromoles, right? And let's just see what happens here, okay? Um, I can multiply some of these numbers out. I'm not concerned about that so much. Okay, I'm really not concerned about the numbers, but I just wanna show you the units do work out. All right, so notice in the denominator, I'm gonna have a mils here, right? Notice that, I don't care about this 10 to the six or the 60, but notice I have, oh, I forgot to show you that these moles cancel, but notice I have a one over micromole in the denominator. So one over micromole in the denominator is a micromole in the numerator, and then I have a, a one over minute in the numerator, so that goes to the denominator. And, it, and this will, there will be some number out here, but this proves that you can take, um, you can take ultimately this DC DT in, in this stuff right here and convert it to micromole per mil per minute. Okay, now one important thing here is that, a, this is just something that you have to take my word on, a micromole per minute this is U, this is one unit of activity. So however, micro, however, however many micromoles the enzyme can catalyze per minute, that's however many U's there are, or units of activity. So if I take U, so if I have micromole per minute is equal to U, let me just divide both of these sides by mil, the number of milliliters, and you see now that I get this. So U per ml is equal to micromoles per mil per minute. Okay, and that's just sort of the rigorous proof as to how you get units of activity. So one unit of activity per mil is the number of micromoles per minute it catalyzes in a milliliter. Okay, that is just the definition. Okay, this is all this is is a definition that you just kind of have to take as word. Okay, if you want to calculate the total U, um, you just multiply by ultimately the total number of milliliters that you have. We're going to go over more of that in another video. But suffice it to say, right now, this is where the U per ml comes from. Then everything else basically comes out of this. So it's really important that you see where this comes from and you see that it actually does work. So this was just the enzyme activity derivation. Um, it was a little rigorous. Hopefully it made a little bit of sense. And in the next few videos, we're going to actually go over um, how you calculate other things like specific activity. Um, you can actually determine concentration, total activity, um, basically construct the purification table. So thanks for watching this video. Make sure to like it, subscribe to the channel for future videos and notifications. Thank you very much.